excited. I haven't had someone who made something in England for a while. Great. So uh, especially now that um, we have a king on the throne, maybe it's uh, it's quite a uh, fate or kismet that we should talk about a, a vodka that is, you know, all kind of came from a king tangentially. Um, yes. So yeah. um, why don't you, you know, I know who you are. So why don't you tell everyone who you are and uh, what you do? Cool. Thank you for having me for a start. Um, my name is Emma. I am co-founder of Edward 1902. We make English potato vodka here um, in the UK. We're based right on the border of Yorkshire and Lincolnshire. Um, and we make, as we were just mentioning, I've got a bottle here, we make um, vodka from the King Edward potato. So um, the potato is a local variety to us, um, where, we're the, where we're based at the distillery. It was founded, I first cultivated, I think they say, um, eight miles away. So it's a really local variety to us. Um, the whole thing came about because my other co-founder um, is in the potato growing um, business. He's fourth generation. Um, and they have been growing King Edward for over 100 years um, locally. And anyone that doesn't know much about potatoes the king edward is a real all-rounder potato it's really creamy it's known for its creamy nose um and long before i was involved in the conversation ben and richard two of the co-founders were um were adamant that with this potato they could do something fun they wanted a bit of a um a passion project with it you know there's not it's not that sexy growing and selling potatoes so um they they were convinced that the King Edward potato, being local, the conditions that we grow it in, um, Lincolnshire limestone soils is sort of the best growing conditions for that potato. Um, so it really is a Lincolnshire through and through potato. Um, and they, there wasn't many single variety vodkas on the market. Um, so we all came together, the families got together. My father has um, worked with Richard for many, many years. Um, he wasn't quite prepared to do it himself, but he said, I know um, my son and my daughter would be really interested. Um, this was back in 2018. Mm -hmm. I, um, I was working in London in hospitality. Um, I started off working here. I worked mainly in the event side of things. So I was working at the O2 Arena. I was a venue manager there. And then I moved to private members clubs. Um, and then I was head of sales for a big events and restaurant group. So I kind of, I was dipping my toe in the hospitality scene here, but I was certainly no mixologist. Um, I can't play. I've actually never worked on a bar until now. Um, now I, I work a lot on the bar because we do an awful lot of events. So, um, so that's, that's my background, what I brought to the table. My brother is um, a microbiologist. So he was, he, I think he'd been working for an environmental agency, um, wanted something else to do. Um, and basically my father put us up to it. He said they'd be really interested. Um, Richard and Ben didn't have the skill set in terms of, you know, of selling it and making it and marketing it. So collectively we thought this is a brilliant recipe to try and make this a success. They knew they had the great raw ingredient on the doorstep. And, um, and yeah, it took. A couple of years. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Um, okay, okay, okay. Slow down, slow down. We need way more of that sorry. story and a little bit of what we've done in two seconds. I have so many sorry. questions. No, not at all. Go, go. Um, all right. So um, one of the things, so you said that they had been growing potatoes for four centuries or yeah. four generations. A fourth generation. Yeah. Fourth generations, right. Yeah. So they'd been selling potatoes for four generations. Um, who had... Like, was it, was it always King Edward potatoes and who were they selling to? So a, a mix of potatoes of which the King Edward is just our local variety, but that's the one that we were sort of emotionally attached to. And that's the one that we thought, here's a good story in terms of making, making spirits. Um, oh, I think, I don't know, it's about the potato side of the business really, but you know, big supermarket, they do all thought. And I suppose one of the nice things is. The vodka side of it repurposes the potato for all the rejects at the supermarket. And obviously wonky veg was a huge thing a couple of years ago when Jamie Oliver brought that to, to the table. And the nice thing is about processing 
um, potato and vodka is that we can use wonky potatoes. We can utilize all the rejects that we're not going to be sold into the shops. It's slightly different now, I guess, because they do bags of wonky buds and this, that and the other, but there's still an awful lot um, a lot that wouldn't be used and wouldn't be sold into the supermarkets. And... Well, it's great. It's like it has a sustainability uh, factor already built in with the wonky potatoes. Now, the guys, were they just playing around with the idea of having a spirit? Did they see that, you know, spirits were the thing? What did that come out of, that idea of, okay, let's make a vodka from this after so many years? Yeah. A bit, a bit of both, really. Um, they just, knowing the potato industry and the way they do, they were just convinced that there wasn't anything out there that would be the same as what we could create from just the king of potato, which, again, is, is the local one that we, we kept coming back to. Um, a lot of potato, uh, there are a few out there um, that use single varieties, um, but I'm most anyway. potato bockers... Sorry. I meant, I meant, why even start a vodka in the first place? They're four generations potato growers. Um, passion project. It's just a passion project. Okay. Yeah, they just, they were convinced that they could do something else with the potatoes, with the knowledge they had. Um, and they were convinced they could create something that was really, really, really premium. Um, and with the gin boom that was going on, um, and it's kind of coming to a bit of a, an end now. Um, with the gin boom at its peak, I guess, there was, there was talk about what spirits were going to, you know, come next, what was going to be the next big thing. Um, and, and there was just this growing interest in potato vodka. People around the country and up in Scotland were producing potato vodka. And I think we just thought, well, this is it. This is what we need to try and do. And we don't want to take any longer thinking about it. We just need to, you know, we knew the process would take long enough. Um, and it just as if, you know, we, it was perfect timing. I was, I was ready to, I was coming to a natural end with the job I'd been in for seven years. Um, I sat down with my boss and he said, um, he said, we were looking at a budget for the next, the upcoming year. And he just went, Emma, you're, you're not in it anymore, are you? And I said, I'm not. And it, I just had a kick moment and I thought, I knew this was all going on in the background and I knew the opportunity to do something of our own. Um, and I thought, okay, this is, this is the right time. And then lo and behold, six months later, we went into lockdown. Oh, <laughs> That's uh, a boy. different story. All right, wait, before the six months, before the lockdown story. Um, so you're, you, you've got this idea, you know, I guess you have to buy a still and all that. Um, what were the next yeah. steps from, okay, we're going to do a vodka. We have the team. Let's go. Yeah. So. Richard had a friend who had recently sold his business and he was looking for something fun, something to invest in. And we approached him and he was like, why aren't you guys making vodka? The so they'd obviously had conversations. He was like, your potato growers, the best vodka made out of potatoes. Why aren't we doing this? And, you know, long story short, he became our investor. Um, we ordered a beautiful big still. Um, we're based on the potato growing site. So we're, we're what we call a real soil to spirit production. So everything is controlled. The potatoes are stored next door, basically. So we were like, we've got the space, we've got the ability to do it. And that's a real faulty position to be in. You know, we didn't have to start in our kitchen at home like a lot of, you know, smaller distilleries do. Um, and obviously it's different when you're making vodka, we're making it on potatoes. We're not buying in grain spirit and distilling it like a lot of gin, you know, um, gene brands would do so it was a it was a big thing to get this still and to get set up and it always takes a lot longer than you'd ever realize of course um, everything does and that feels like ever, as everything does um and yeah and then we had to learn how to make vodka because we did not have a distiller on the books you know we didn't we were a team of people that thought we've got different skill sets here that are going to work together we've got a great raw ingredient but now we've got to figure out how to make vodka. And, um, and I think that's a special piece of our story is that we didn't employ, you know, a team that had been doing it for 20, 30 years. We've kind of all learned on the job and we've all been doing this. And um, yeah, we've got an interesting, you know, makeup of the team. You know, Ben is very technical. He runs the site. Um, Matthew, my brother, being, you know, being a microbiologist, the way he approaches things and he taught, you know, went on his studying courses. Uh, Richard with his knowledge of the potato industry and my 
kind of knowledge in sales, marketing, and a little bit about the hospitality industry. Um, so that helps with the on-trade side of the business. Well, but, then how, yeah. how, did you, how did you know how you wanted it to taste? A lot of trial and error. A lot of trial and error. And even down to trialing different yeast that we use, um, different cuts of the potatoes. Um, interestingly, and we're learning throughout the year that, you know, the potatoes will taste slightly different. Each batch, because it's a batch process, is slightly different. Um, and that's something I think that's really exciting. We kind of, we made our first, we were happy with our first, our first batch in April 20. And I think we started trying different vodkas earlier that year. And it was a case of, we'd all sit, literally, we would just sit around the table, we would trial and error and we would trial and, you know, especially when it's a group committee, that can take some time. But we were... Whilst we were in a rush to get going, we were also not in a rush. We were doing it in our own time. And it was most important that we were creating what we perceived to be a really premium product. We were really wanting to start flying the flag for, um, for premium British spirits. The category was growing. We wanted to contribute to that with something that we, you know, would be really, really proud of. And, and yeah, I mean, I can't remember exactly how many batches we tried, but we did try some. And it was well, down to different yeast. Like I said, it was... Well, at the beginning, um, did you just buy all the vod like potato-made vodkas yes. and sit around the table and go, okay, I want it to taste a little like this. Yeah. No, no, I want it to taste a little bit like this. Let's try and make a little of this. Yeah? Yeah, to, yeah, to a certain degree, you do. You kind of, what's the benchmark? You know, right. which ones do we love? Which ones do we drink? Um Richard was a vodka drinker. My husband's Polish, so I am used to Eastern European vodkas um, in my house. Um, so we kind of knew what the benchmark was and where we wanted it to sit in the market. We knew what we, um, we kind of knew what we were aiming for, but that's not always what translates into the first glass that you try, right? It was, um, yeah, and, but. So about how long did it take for you to find exactly like, yeah, like that Eureka? Oh yeah. Yeah. This is it. This is it. This is where we're, we, we've got something that we can put in. The I bottle. think we were, I think we were a few, a few months. That's not too a bad. A few months of trial and no, I, then my, my guys might correct me, but I don't remember it being as long as you'd, you'd imagine it to be. Um, that, and I think that again was what we were so shocked by that just by using what we believe to be such a great raw ingredient to begin with made all the difference you know we didn't have to cut corners we didn't have to do anything you know trained to make it work it just worked and it was just about getting the balance and yeah and it was it's crazy to think back it's only been two years since we started this but so that first batch that we all sat around and went this is it we are loving it tastes smooth it tastes just what we want it to do and it tastes a bit different to everything else that's out there because Historically, vodka was neutral. It was bland. You were meant to disguise it with a mixer. It was meant to be flavorless um, and odorless. And actually, that's not how vodka is now. People are open to a characterful vodka. And that's, you know, that's, that's definitely where we are. We're not a bland. We're not a disguise me and don't drink me with lemonade or Coke or anything like that. This is a, this is let the, let the vodka sing. It's a real, it's a real flavorsome vodka. So once you had the liquid, had you did you already have the name and the bottle idea and um, kind of the label? Talk me through the kind of the marketing bit of it. Yeah, so we did the label and well, the label we don't have a label on the bottle. They're sprayed. Um, the bottle process, I think, took the longest. We knew we where we wanted to pitch the product in the market. We wanted to sit at the premium end of the market. It's a really expensive process. It's a really expensive process, the way we make um, Edwards. So we knew that the price had to reflect that. Therefore, the bottle, the branding, all of that had to reflect a, a premium product. So we, we went down the line of having a bespoke bottle made. Oh, wait, before you get into the bottle, talk me through the name. Now, I know because I've done my research, but uh, cool. the King Edward Potato. Um, yes. Why is it called that? You have, um, oh, I'm looking away because you have 1902. There's, yes, is part of it. So, so, so the King Edward potato 
cultivated just down the road from the distillery, as I've mentioned. It was one. Of, it is one of the oldest English varieties of potato. Um, and in 1902, um, King Edward VII was um, around his coronation. They gave the um, potato its royal ascent, its name, um, and that's where it came from. So Edward's 1902 directly translate to the name of the potato, the year it was sort of given it, um, given its title. So yeah, in terms of what we were saying about the king, we are directly talking about the royal story here and the royal history. And um, I've got, uh, you know, I've saved a little fact about um, King Edward VII later for you. Okay. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, um, it is one of the oldest, the oldest cultivars of potatoes. And that, yeah, Edward's 1902, that's where it is. You knew, okay, Edward's 1902. Now back to the bottle. That it was going to be premium. Back to the bottle, it, yeah. So, yeah, we knew we knew what we wanted. Um, we didn't want to go off the shelf. So we were really lucky that we're in the same county as one of the UK's best glass bottle producers. Um, so we paid them a visit and we basically designed this bottle together. Um, we worked with a marketing agency, Early Doors, who, and I can show you here. So their bottle design was kind of designed to replicate the crown. So we wanted this bespoke finish around the neck. Ah, yes. We, we wanted something that um, supported its name, that told a story, and that had a really beautiful, unique finish to it. We wanted something that would stand out. And luckily, most people grab the bottle and go, oh my gosh, I've never seen a bottle like this. I mean, at the front of the bottle, we embossed the, the W from the Edwards, yeah, your camera's much better than mine. Um, and these have a vignette finish. So we tried all sorts of different finishes to the bottle. Our very first batch that we released in April 20, we released 1,902 bottles um, to our founding members. We released the Founders Club and they were fully black bottles. So they are kind of collector's bottles now. That was our first ever batch that we did. Um, so we saved the beautiful black bottle for that. That was going to be our first release. It was always going to be the most special bottle that we made. Um, and then from that, we we settled on sort of a half and half. Yeah. Um, because we don't use a label, because we just use, we spray the, right. and all the printed spray directly on. Um, using a clear bottle was really difficult. You, We were struggling to see the text through the back right. and through the front and... Um, the vignette was kind of a really good middle ground. We got that unique finish. We got something totally different. Um, but the white tech was still showing through in our, um, and then we've got the, the beautiful metallic gold that we add on. Um, and if you open the bottle, there's obviously we've got the bespoke capsules and we've actually got bespoke wooden corks in there as well. They're embossed corks for every bottle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A Again. lot of attention to detail. Again, keeping it UK based, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, some of my guys have been at the bottle producer today and it's just great having them, A, that they're so close to us, they're Yorkshire based, um, and being able to, you know, have our hands held and, and work through that process with them is, is just great. And yeah, I mean, they're one of a few local suppliers we work with, but how great that we can, you know, have our bottle made a few miles away on such a scale. Um, yeah, it's great. It's yeah, it's wonderful. Fabulous. We had our own, so we had the mold. So it's what you, you have a mold made. Um, so all the future bottles of Edwards, and we'll talk about the rhubarb that we've just released in a moment, will all just fit that mold. So all of our vodka will have the same bottle. They'll just be slightly different in color or in design or. Oh, great. Fantastic. Now we'll just stick to the, um, just this, the, this vodka now. But um, so you have it. You have your, it's in the bottle. You've got your black bottles. You have your founders. And obviously your founders are your biggest supporters. There's a lot of that gal there. Uh -huh. How did you feel that you were going to get yourself heard? That was, I think that be, that's the hardest thing when you're a small independent and you're trying to break the market and you launch during a worldwide lockdown. It was we we could you couldn't make it up the things that we we were up against in those early doors you know you just you would have wished it on any new business and that was hard 
But the to spin a positive on that, we were all at home. Everyone was focused at home. We have time to build the brand. We have time to get our e-commerce platform up and running. We have time to shout on social media. We have time to engage with people that otherwise we perhaps wouldn't have been able to. Um, because no one was behind the bar working. They weren't running around, running shit. You know, the buyers for the supermarkets and the shops weren't running around the store floor. You know, everyone was forced to sort of slow down. And it's the only, you know, it's the only positive we can take from it was that we had time to really focus. And then when, when the world did open up again, it looked like we had a full brand ready to go because we'd worked so hard on the website. Um, Because everything takes longer than you anticipate, right? You think... Oh, we've got the bottle, we're ready, and we've got the liquid and we're ready. And then you go, oh my gosh, the website's not quite where I want it to be. Or there's always something. And, um, but the lockdown happening, yes, it was, it was awful. But at the same time, we had such an opportunity to engage with people that I think we probably wouldn't have been able to do so early on. So we were all over social media. We were trying to grow a following there and we were trying to grow a local following. That's how we first started. We, 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 Lincolnshire is a huge county. We're right on the border of Yorkshire as well. Um, Richard, co-founder, is Yorkshire and the Lincolnshire side of it. So we were able to sort of spread the love across those two counties. And that was our, that was our plan initially was Brexit forced everyone to support local a lot more than they'd ever done before, even post-Brexit. So we had a bit of a captive audience of people that wanted to support local producers. And I think that was wonderful that people were wanting to spend maybe a little bit more on a product because A, they couldn't go anywhere and B, they thought, well, I know the guys that make this. It's, it's down the road from me. And um, especially in Lincolnshire, there, there are a handful of other, um, of other great distilleries, but it's such a big county and we make such great produce. There was no one really making potato vodka like we did. Um, so we, we started shouting locally. We tried to get local buy-in. We were talking to the papers. We were um, small steps, I guess. And the founders really helped with that. You, you set up a founders club and you get this wonderful community of people that are your biggest supporters from the word go. Um, and, then, and then we just started to reach, you know, far and wide. Let's try and talk to some slightly bigger retailers. Let's try. We tried to talk to the old trade. It was really difficult. Um, obviously nothing was open. They weren't sure whether they'd reopen. And those that were towards the end of lockdown, they had so much stock. They had so much stock left. They weren't taking on new, new brands. So that then brought a whole new set of challenges when the world opened up. And the on praise started to open up again, but not for new brands. And that was really tricky. So it certainly feels like 2022 has been our first year in business. Even though we've been going for two years, the ups and downs of starting a business during lockdown has, you know, finally is fading away from us. Um, well, it can't, it can't hurt yeah. that you have um, won so many awards. Yeah, and that, you know, that's the other thing. So lockdown allowed us to enter a lot of awards early doors. So we just sat around, all of us on our laptops independently, because obviously we weren't together. Um, and we'd got, we'd got pallets of vodka that we'd put in this beautiful bottle and we had nowhere to send it or sell it. And we were able to, you know, sell a little bit online, but we entered every award that we could afford and that we could do. Um, as some stuff went off to San Francisco, we did stuff locally here in the UK and our first batch won several gold awards. And that's, I think that was what we needed to know that we were on something good. Um, and to know that the team we had in place were capable of some really great things. And of um, course, to know that... And to know first... Also, to know that um, um, that what you think tastes good, someone else tastes good as well. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good benchmark. I've said it, I said it before with other vodkas, but it's a really good... It's a really good stopping point to say, actually, yes, we obviously love it. We have to. But I think they love it. Mm -hmm. And these people who have tried hundreds and thousands of other spirits, think that we're making good alcohol, you know, from a small team that have never done it before, from a product that we are super proud of being local to us and really British product. It just, it all fell into place. It all just started to fall into place. And I think we've just grown and grown from that point. So the vodka, 
I lose track now. The vodka won several gold awards. It's got two star great taste in terms of the retail side of things, but they went out to San Francisco when we released the coffee. That picked up some great awards. Um, and we do keep going with it. You know, we want to make sure that what we're making today is as good as it was in April 22 and um, April 20. So we still enter awards with the same liquid just to check that we're still making, you know, the vodka as good as we still think it is. Um, since you brought up the coffee, um, you have uh, coffee, you have rhubarb vodka, and you have the canned, canned, um, canned cocktails, which I have behind me as well. Um, tell me about how each of them started as well. So the coffee was the next. So I think we released the, I think we released the vodka in the April 20. And then naturally, when things get exciting, you all sat there going, what's next? What's next? And you, you have to calm yourselves down a bit, but it's really exciting when the ball's rolling. And we've got this distillery now that's working and we know the process and we know what we're doing, we like. So we are really fortunate to be based probably 200 meters from one of the best coffee roasters in the UK. Um, and to say we literally knocked on the door and said, hey guys, you might have seen us. We're around the corner. Um, they all knew each other. Um, from where, where they've been bathed and trading for years. We think that this vodka, because it's really creamy, it got sort of, and a lot of the feedback we were getting from the awards was vanilla, chocolate, creamy. So we were like, we need to make a coffee liqueur. These guys are next door. We approached them and we just very collaboratively worked on a cold brew coffee liqueur. Um, so we tried several different roasts of coffee beans. Um, the guy from the, I'll never forget, I drove up to the distillery one day um, and the guy from the coffee roasters literally walked around just with loads of coffees and he'd obviously had the, he'd had the liquid, he'd had the vodka to try and we just sat around and it was a great day and we were just trying every different coffee that he thought worked and um, again, collectively we sat around and we came to the agreement that a single origin Guatemalan coffee bean was the perfect complement to the single variety vodka that we've made. We kept it really simple. There's no, you know, there's no mixing of ingredients here. These are just two really good standalone products, ingredients that just blend perfectly. And um, so that winter, I think, I may be uh -huh. losing track, we released the cold brew coffee liqueur. And we designed it again. We, we benchmarked ourselves across what we saw were the, the leaders in the market of coffee liqueur. Interestingly, very little made here in the UK. And that was going to be our thing. We were producing a, an English coffee liqueur that we made here. Um, some of the best ones that I've tried are international. Um, but we released that in the winter. It became our biggest seller. Everyone loves the espresso martini. So suddenly everyone was really interested in trying a new, a new product. It's a coffee for which coffee liqueur. So there was a lot of, or there is a lot of sweet options out there. They're kind of the, the bigger brands and they're, you know, they're higher in sugar content because that is what most people look for when they're, you know, when they're making their espresso martinis. But we saw there's, there's enough of those on the market. We, we wanted to find our niche and we went with a coffee forward coffee liqueur. So lower sugar content um, in the sorts that if you're making yourself one at home, you add what sugar you want. Of course. And that was always one of the reasons I didn't love drinking a breath of martinis in the evening because my heart would be going, they'd be so sweet. Um, so we, you know, collectively we thought if we're making one, this is what it needs to stand for. This is what it needs to be. And, um, and yeah, we sent that one out to the San Francisco World Spirit Competition. And which you won gold. Up double gold best yeah. Double gold best in class in the liqueur category. So it was a really big deal for us. And it kind of put us on the map a little bit. People were starting to go, who are these guys? What's what's this? They're a year old. What they, you know, they don't just come in and make a double gold winning right. liqueur. Um and that was an amazing feeling. That was in the February of twenty one that, that award came through. Um Again, after a strange lockdowny Christmas, and um, and yeah, the coffee liqueur is just going from strength to strength. Like I said, it's 
it's probably our best seller at the moment. Um, coffee liqueur is really accessible. People love it. There's multiple ways to drink it. Um, and the espresso martini is one of the most popular cocktails around the world. So why not? It's, it's just a marriage made in heaven. Absolutely. And what a great thing yeah. to say. And okay. if you're... What a great thing to say, um, you know, yes, we won this coffee liqueur, but hey, we've been doing a vodka for ages. So come and try that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and talk just with the espresso martini, encouraging people to use both because the coffee liqueur is made from the Edward vodka. There's never going to be a more perfect match. Of course. And when people try it, when people try it, you know, they're often they're like, wow, I've not tried. And it's, I think because we're using the same base spirit to make the liqueur, they just work really nicely. And we, again, it was one of those, oh my God, guys, what have we done? We're so proud of it. Um, and by the way, it really I, I did open. I wish I could have one right now. That's maybe your next. Know, we're going to talk I about your. Made one. Yeah, we're we're going to talk about your canned cocktails in a second. Um, yeah, maybe that's the next thing is to can an espresso martini cocktail. It yes, I've been <laughs> very interested and very keen on doing that for a long time. Um, but yeah, it definitely releasing the coffee liqueur and it winning such a big award early doors certainly did help us with the vodka it certainly made people just more aware of that we were here and what we were doing and it allowed us to start telling our story a little bit about what we were doing and flying the flag for you know for some really great stuff that's happening here in the uk and there really is some amazing spirits being made here we just you know we're all still trying to build and you know when you're an independent brand you can't always shout louder than the big boys so it's uh, we're getting there you are you are now now i have a question did you look around and say, what fruit is so typically British that we have to make a vodka with it, and thus the rhubarb? Yes. And again, it's very, very local to us. We are fortunate enough in Yorkshire to have the rhubarb triangle, which is where the of best rhubarb is made. And um, it's so quintessentially English. Everyone has such great memories of rhubarb. Um, there's a lot of strawberry flavorings out there and we thought, okay, we wanted something that again, we had a story and the fact that we worked with one of the oldest rhubarb growers in Yorkshire is so lovely. And, um, we tried different processes again with the rhubarb vodka. Um, the process that we use and the way we make our rhubarb vodka is we press pure rhubarb juice. So again, it's something different. There's no flavorings or anything like that. This is when making the vodka in the distillery, when you're making the classic vodka, you cut it back from 96% to 40 using water right. with pure water. When we make the rhubarb, the process that we loved the outcome of was we cut it back with rhubarb juice. So the rhubarb juice is added during that distillation process. And um, each bottle of the rhubarb has about 30% rhubarb juice in the bottle so it's a really rhubarb forward um different rhubarb vodka um and again that bit was important to us there are other rhubarb things out there what can we do that's different well we start by using a really good raw ingredient a really good raw ingredient and um no i don't so i don't have that they're on our doorstep and i don't have the bottle in front of me but um it's pink um is does that come right from pink. Does it come from the juice or is it a colored glass? It's a colored glass. It's a frosted pink. I don't have a bottle here either. It's a frosted pink. Um, we wanted to make sure it really stood out. We wanted it to really represent what was going on in the bottle. And, um, and yeah, we just thought, we tried different colors and we were like, do you know what? We all fell in love with this bright pink bottle and it's really filled our cup this summer, you know, going on the road and having the bright pink bottles everywhere. People love it. Um, and it's a, it's a conversation starter as well. You know, they're then curious what's in that bright pink, beautiful, different bottle. And, um, and then a lovely pink liquid inside it. Yeah, I think it had to be pink. I mean, the rhubarb is pink. It has to be pink, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, another yeah. thing that's pink. It, it's, it's not right. So... And now I have these these gorgeous bottles, these gorgeous um, cans in front of me. Um, was this also a lockdown baby, or did you think of doing the canned after? 
Yeah, the, well, we've been talking about cans for a long time, but me being me, I very much was like, slow down one thing at a time. Building a brand does not happen overnight. Right. So I was very keen to really build um, a base for the vodka. And then we came out with the coffee liqueur and then we had the rhubarb. But the cans have been in conversation since the start. It's such a growing category. It's, it's an interest to almost everybody. Um, especially when COVID and finished and um, the world opened up again, that's when it felt like the right time to do it. When people could socialize again, when we could go on the road and do events again and take the cans with us. Um, so again, it took a little while. It took a while with the design of the cans. I was very, in my head, I knew exactly what I wanted them to look like. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I'm not a designer or an artist, that often takes a long time to translate onto um, a label. But again, I just worked uh, really, really closely with the, with the marketing guys that I'd worked with on the classic bottle, which was wonderful. They know the brand. We've worked with them from the start. Um, and we knew we had the rhubarb liquid. Um, we just didn't have the rhubarb bottle. The rhubarb bottle is what took us a long time to agree on the color of the bottle and the finish, whether we gloss or frosted. So the cans were kind of working alongside the launch of the rhubarb. Um, and we were aiming for a summer launch, which we managed to do this summer. So we wanted to do one can with the classic vodka to really showcase the simplicity of a can spritz. Um, and we weren't going for strong, heavy cocktails. We wanted our first can to be really accessible, really easy to drink. And last year and this year, we had gone on tour with Top Carriage and the Pub in the Park festivals um, and we took our spritz bar we called it a spritz bar we did vodka spritzes um for every event and it just worked really well so we thought that's what we need to can that's what we need to put in the cans to start with the response to the spritz serves was really good um a really approachable way to drink vodka as well for for most people who maybe are scared of vodka or have bad memories of vodka or prefer gin so the spritz serves felt like a really good thing to try them in the cans as well. So the spritzes are the rhubarb spritz, which is pretty much just a rhubarb soda. Mm -hmm. Very simple, cocaine from the rhubarb. Mm -hmm. And the other one, we, Rich's favorite drink is a vodka lime and soda. And every, it's really accessible. Everyone likes a good vodka lime and soda. And it's a really nice serve with Edward. But I, was, I wanted something more premium. It needed a twist. And we were trying all these samples. I actually went and met, I went and met Ben and Matthew at Peterborough Service Station because I'm based in London, they're based at the distillery. And we met, it was the morning and people must have thought we were mad. And we just filled the table with samples of, of, um, of the mix. And we were trying everything and we tried these lovely lime heavy mixes. And I was like, but everyone can make that at home. Why are people going to buy it in a can? So we then went back and we experimented with a fiery ginger. And that's what I thought was missing. It's my favorite way of drinking the classic vodka anyway. Um, ginger and citrus just works really well. So the natural progression was to go for a vodka lime soda with a hint of ginger. And that's what we put in the can. And um, yeah, we, we launched those in July this summer. And the response has been great so far. Um, luckily, we've had a nice hot summer for people to to drink them and straight out of the fridge, they're just the perfect, no alcohol. So they're only 5% ABV, which makes them quite great. easy to drink. Um, and yeah, we just wanted, we just wanted to showcase each of the vodkas and that's what we came out with just two to begin with. We were so excited, obviously, and we wanted to can five or six <laughs> and I wanted to do an espresso martini and I think we still will one day, but the guys were like, we've just got to go with two, mm -hmm. you know, um, so again, taking it baby steps, the response has been great. We, we took them to the last couple of the pub in the park festivals and people were drinking them at the festival. Um, and that was a proud moment watching people walking around with the cans of Edgeworth. And that was a, that was a lovely finish in, um, in Chiswick last weekend, the weekend before. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of where we are with things. We've, we've released two products this year. We've done the rhubarb vodka and we've done the cans. And we're now on to the next. We're now thinking already, you know, because alongside the vodka, 
we've got a working distillery, the Ultram World Distillery, um, has other things going on that will be, you know, will be coming out of the woodworks under a different brand. It won't be Edwards is very much our King Edward potato brand. So that is everything vodka related. But there's some other really exciting things that we're working on. And um, we've already done two launches this year. That feels like we've achieved a lot. Um, it, well, it's incredible what people have been able to achieve when we were locked down, really. Absolutely. Clearly. You know, it never ceases to uh, surprise me and amaze me about what has been created in that time when we really couldn't do anything. And I mean, in the drinks industry, the creativity, the innovation has been insane. It's been amazing. And we've come out of it with so many new products yeah. and a whole different way of thinking, which just shows what mankind can do, really. It, it's of it's been to. really inspiring um, yeah. to be a, a, a part of that movement, to be to be one of those, you know, brands that's emerging. But when we've done events and we're talking to other brands out there and they've also been something from lockdown, you know, the lockdown, the cocktail type company, the pre batch cocktail. It's amazing. Like we, that just wasn't really something that people did before. And um, there's so many amazing things that have come out. And I'm, yeah, I'm just super chuffed that we're, we're one of those and that hopefully we're, we're here to stick around. So yeah, absolutely. Now you said that you had a surprising fact for me. I don't want to forget that before we go on to our last two questions. It's only just a little fun fact about it's fun for us. It's really nerdy, I'm sure. But obviously the King Edward Potato um, was related to King Edward VII. Every distillery names their still, right? Everybody. And they tend to be female. We're all, they're all female still. Ours isn't female. Um, we, we sat around and we like we need to think of something really cool for the still. Everyone has a cool story and ours isn't that cool. We call it Bertie. Our still is called Bertie. Um, threefold reason. It just worked. King, Ed King Edward's nickname was Bertie to his family. That's what yes. he was known as. So that was like, okay, that makes sense. My husband is a Bert. My husband's a Bert. So I was like, well, I like that because that, you know, that means something to me. And Ben and Joe's dog. Is a Bertie. So we were like, guys, it has to be Bertie. It's not the cutest. It's not particularly sexy, but that's the name of the still. And he's engraved on the front of the still and he makes as many photos as we can. So. Well, I love that. And maybe <laughs> if you get a second still, it'll be Lily for Lily Langtree, his girlfriend. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't think we've got room for another still. It's huge. <laughs> <laughs> Just one still then, Bertie. I love that. I yeah, love that. Bertie. Now, I always end asking two questions. The first is, and I know you're not a bartender, but I'm yeah. sure you've been making lots of cocktails lately. What would be your top tip for the home bartender when they're starting to make a cocktail with Edwards 1902? So I guess I can take my own advice here because I'm not a mixologist. And during lockdown, I did become a home bartender. Um, I would say, and my, my advice to myself and my husband was just start small, start simple, Get the key ingredients that you need. It's so easy to go online or go in the shop and buy everything that you think, things you've never heard of. But just keep it really simple because a lot of the classic cocktails, which are all back in fashion, everyone's drinking the classics now, which is wonderful, are easy to make with just a few ingredients. And I think definitely start small, really good quality products on your bar. And if you can, squeeze your own juices. Shop bought juices, just don't do the spirits any favors. So I will always have fresh grapefruit, orange, limes, and lemons at home. And I insist on A, garnishing with them, but B, using them in the drinks. And every drink that I make with Edwards, I'll always finish with a bit of the citrus because it just really works with the vodka. So they're, they're my two things that I always do. A really good stocked bar with a few high quality products. And yeah, if I can, and I normally can be bothered just to squeeze my own juice. No. It makes such a difference. Absolutely. Anyone who listens to Lush Life, they should be embarrassed if they are not squeezing their own okay, juice, good, everyone. Good. Okay. All right. You can buy a lemon and a lime almost anywhere in the world. So it's squeeze just not it. the same. It's it not the not. same. It's like, it's a whole different thing. And you should not, yeah. you should only put the best ingredients in your cocktail. Agreed. So, because you're drinking it, going in your mouth, put good ingredients in. Now, last question is, you could be anywhere drinking anything right now where would that be and what would you be having well, I actually I thought about this I am actually 
going to be doing it in a few weeks in New York. New York is my, aside from London, New York for me is the best place. I adore New York. I've been fortunate to go enough to go several times. And the bar scene in New York, I think, is just phenomenal. I'm, I always come back inspired, wow, you know, and they're not big wine drinkers there like they like we are here cocktail forward everything is cocktail heavy so I will probably be drinking a martini my husband will be ordering a Negroni and we'll be sat in one of our favorite bars in New York watching the world go by because we'll be child free which is always a pleasure and um and yeah that's it well I'll be actually living that in a few weeks time there's nowhere better for me to sit and have a really good cocktail one of the bars in New York do you have a favorite bar in New York oh I did have a favourite bar and it didn't survive lockdown. Oh. It was in the West Village called the Highlands and it was an English, kind of English owned, but beautiful. We loved going there. My friends that live locally all went there. It didn't survive because I've just recently cried. Um, but I mean, we'll probably go down to Dead Rabbit. Everyone has to go there and have a cocktail. They do. Um, but I think we'll also be looking at what, what's new, what, what else is out there. Well, you can report back to all of us while we're sipping our we're, our cocktails in a can. So, um, listen, thank you so much for being on here. I really appreciate it. And it was yeah, so thank great you so to much hear for your having story. me. And yes, thank, thank you for having me. Everyone, it's been a pleasure. Everyone who lives in the UK should be buying locally, and it's right up the street. And not only that, but it is absolutely delicious. So, um, again, thanks. Thank and, you so much. And we'll see you around. Thank you.